spring of 2011 brought down governments across North Africa and the Middle East. But despite widespread protests, Algeria's regime survived, and parliamentary elections this month cemented its hold on power. So why was there no Algerian uprising? And could one still take place? When the Arab Spring swept through North Africa last year, Algerians, like their neighbors in Tunisia, were among the first to rise up against oppressive rule. But what happened next in Tunisia and elsewhere didn't happen here. Despite the efforts of a new popular opposition movement, which brought thousands onto the streets, the expected uprising against the government of President Abdelaziz Bouteflika failed to materialize. So why not? One prominent activist says it's a question of when, not if. L'Algérie n'est pas une exception. La révolution en Algérie arrivera tôt tard. C'est une question de temps. Critics of the Algerian regime, often accused of being the most repressive in North Africa, insist that opposition has not gone away. They say there have been some 40,000 separate protests across the country in the last 12 months. Protests continue. They reflect mostly everyday grievances, the cost of food, unemployment, poor housing. There's frustration aplenty, but few signs of coherent leadership. Et un peu partout en Algérie, il y a des grèves, il y a des manifestations. Il y a un risque de chaos si on continue comme ça. C'est ce que j'avais dit tout à l'heure, un tsunami populaire. Un tsunami populaire qui risque de balayer le pays et non pas le régime seulement. Parce que nous n'avons aucune institution, tout est gangréné. Toutes les institutions du pays sont gangrénées. Du sommet jusqu'à la base, tout est gangréné. Despite widespread anger against systematic corruption and repression, the opposition has struggled to make headway. Which is why we've come to Algeria, to find out how the current regime and the country's turbulent past may be standing in their way. In the capital, Algiers, all seems calm. But this is a closed, secretive society. We've been warned that the military intelligence known as the DRS keeps everyone under surveillance, that it's dangerous for ordinary Algerians to speak to journalists, and that it's difficult to film openly. We head to the poor suburbs where our writer, Mohamed Dade, has agreed to meet in his cramped home. Like many living here, he's struggling to make a living. The fact that he needs government authorization to publish his books is just one of his many problems. But the biggest hardship, he says, is housing. And self-immolation is something that has become increasingly common. This man has doused himself in petrol and is trying to set himself alight. The incident is caught on a mobile phone. Opposition groups say such sites are becoming common and counted 130 cases of self-immolation last year, mostly young men 
driven to despair by the lack of jobs, housing and education. The problem of suicide n'existait not exist in Algeria. D'autant plus que c'est un pays musulman et le suicide chez nous est illicite et haram. Oui. Et maintenant, le suicide est devenu quelque chose de, de courant. C'est très grave. Ça veut dire ça, ça traduit un état de déliquescence de notre société. Un état de déliquescence de notre société. Et ce pouvoir-là n'arrive pas, n'entend ne, 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 pas, ne, ne voit pas. Ne, ne, C'est quelque chose d'extraordinaire. But what's puzzling is why Algeria is in this state. It's the largest country in Africa, rich in natural resources, deriving 97% of its export earnings from oil and gas. Its natural wealth, combined with its Mediterranean climate, once made it the jewel in the crown of French colonial Africa. Algiers, a busy piece of metropolitan France transplanted across the Mediterranean. The European there always saw something wild and exotic about the southern shore of the Mediterranean. At least until the night of November 1st, 1954, when the Algerian revolt against France began. In 1954, the National Liberation Front, the FLN, launched their campaign for independence from France. It was a brutal seven-year war. Terror spread throughout Algeria. The war left deep emotional and physical scars. Mohamed Dadi's mother remembers. <laughs> In 1962, Algeria won its independence, but Algerian fighters had learnt a lot from their French masters about brutality and torture tactics. That legacy lingers today. <laughs> Independence was followed by 30 years of military rule under the National Liberation Front until people power forced an election in late 1991. But when the opposition Islamic Salvation Front, or FIS, won the first round of voting, the election was quashed with the tacit support of America and the West. Fearful, say opposition activists, of fundamentalism getting a foothold in this part of the world. Supported by the security forces, the ruling FLN hung on to power. In 1992, the only elections libres qu'il y a eu in Algeria ont été bloquées par le, si, le, le régime militaire. Il y a eu le coup d'état 92, et nous persistons encore toujours dans cette illégitimité du pouvoir. What followed was a descent into virtual civil war and the chaos and violence that became known as the Dark Decade. A widely estimated 200,000 people were killed. Some 20,000 disappeared. Entire villages were massacred by government forces or the armed Islamic groups. The terror of those times has left deep scars. <laughs> Almost every family in Algeria has stories from this dark period. Mohamed Dade's cousin, Amar, has spent years looking for his father, who vanished from the street one day in 1994. <laughs> Yeah, 
We've heard of a group that supports families of the disappeared. But to escape the eyes and ears of the authorities, we have to arrange meetings secretly and often at night. We travel across the city to meet the founders of SOS Disappeared, who've collected the names and details of thousands of victims. <laughs> Despite the craving for justice, in 2005, the government announced an amnesty for security forces involved in crimes committed during the dark decade. Nora Dean Belmahoub is an activist and human rights advocate who's been imprisoned several times, most recently in October last year. Even meeting us is risky for Belmahoub, but he's agreed to take us to see Dr. Salah Adin Sadoum, an orthopedic surgeon and one of Algeria's most respected opposition figures. This is how the government's critics get together here, in private homes, away from prying eyes. In the corner, state television is broadcasting live from the funeral of Algeria's first post-independence president. It's the same FLN regime that's been in power since independence and through the dark decade. But the people we see on screen are not the ones with real power, Belmahoud tells us. Nous, en Algérie, contrairement à tout le monde, nous avons ce que vous n'avez pas en Angleterre. Vous n'avez pas de chance. Nous avons un cabinet noir. Vous n'avez pas la chance d'avoir un cabinet noir, sinon vous aurez la pagaille chez vous. Nous, nous avons un cabinet noir. C'est des gens sans, sans visage. Current president Abdelaziz Bouteflika, a former soldier, takes center stage. But he only appears to be in charge. We're told this government is controlled from behind the scenes by a shadow state, the powerful DRS military intelligence. The real power is said to be held by this man, General Mohamed Medien, alias Tufik, who has run the DRS for the past 20 years. This is one of only two known photographs of him. Bouteflika is doing a job for Tufik, for the Secret Service. Nothing else. So Bouteflika can't do anything, nothing at all, without, um, the, the, without the agreement of Tawfiq. But Tawfiq can do whatever he wants without even asking Bouteflika. Uh, this one is, uh... Ahmed Shushan was a captain in the special forces until he fled into exile. Every state has an army. But in Algeria, it's the army who, have, uh, who has a state. Like Captain Shushan, the people who know the workings of the shadow state best are those who once worked inside it. But it's only safe to talk about it once they've escaped the country. Ils sont incrustés partout, quoi. Euh, non seulement les sociétés nationales, euh, surveillant, euh, ils, ont, ils chapeautent le peuple, les mairies, la daïra, euh, les wilayas, les départements, euh, tout. C'est une petite, euh, comment dirais-je, un petit personnel qui gère euh, toute une armée, tout un, tout un pays, quoi. Sadek Meziani, now in self-imposed exile in Europe, was a member of the DRS for 10 years. He has inside knowledge of how it operates. C'était de la surveillance visuelle, ma, ma fonction exacte. C'était là ma, 
ma spécialité. Quoi. Tous les Algériens ils sont terrorisés par ce pouvoir-là, par la DRS exactement. By the end, Meziani worked for a militia unit in the military intelligence with a violent reputation. He pinpoints for us the locations of the military establishments where he says torture takes place. He claims not to have killed or tortured, but says those closest to him did, including his immediate superior. Lui-même, il a tué plus de 30, 300 personnes, ou je ne sais pas si ce n'est pas plus. Lui-même, il torturait des personnes au CPMI, au CPMI, et après il jette le corps ou dans, le, dans un lac ou dans, dans, dans la route comme ça, ou dans, directement dans la mer lui-même. Et des fois, tu, des fois il fait des trucs euh, terribles. Eventually, Meziani says, he learned that the DRS can turn even on its own. He says he was ordered to kill a man from his home village, but refused. Oui, j'étais moi-même torturé. J'étais moi-même torturé pendant 28 jours. Euh... C'était pas facile, c'était pas facile. Franchement, c'était pas facile. Parce que si on va dire euh, des abus, il y, a même, il y avait même... Euh, on a même essayé de me, de me violer carrément. Le rôle des militaires est absolument le key factor dans uh, la résilience du régime algérien. Tout est basiquement dans les mains des militaires, et spécifiquement des militaires d'intelligence, qui est la plus puissante branche de Uh, of this uh, body. And obviously, when you have to face a military power as strong as the Algerian one, it becomes almost impossible to, to challenge it and to, to, to defeat it. Ricardo Fabiani is a political analyst for a London-based consultancy. When you look at Algeria from the outside, you are, what you see actually is just a normal democratic country with elections, with a president, but you have the military in the background controlling and trying to control as much as they can the main political leaders and the main social and economic uh, actors in, in Algeria. Back in Algeria, most of the opposition activists we talk to say it is fear of the DRS and the dread of returning to the violence of the 1990s, which is stopping Algerians rising in revolt. But they also tell us that this fear is losing its hold over the young. They don't necessarily remember the dark days. So demographics may play a part in the future direction of Algeria. Two-thirds of Algerian society is under the age of 35. Youth unemployment is over 40%. Increasingly, they feel they have nothing to lose. Every day for the past year, somewhere in Algeria, growing numbers of young protesters have been demonstrating for jobs, better housing, against police violence. In theory then, Algeria's youth may become a force to be reckoned with but only if they can come together and not be outwitted by the state. Last year, as dictatorial regimes across the Arab world began to tumble, President Abdelaziz Bouteflika offered limited reforms. He ended the country's decades-old state of emergency, raised food subsidies, and promised a degree of democratic participation. The reforms themselves prompted protests. <laughs> Vous avez déterré notre avenir. The people became increasingly divided. The cleverness of the government's divisive strategy, activists say, can be seen in what happened to human rights defender Dr. Mustafa Bouchachi. In February last year, he was a fierce opponent of the government.
تعبير عن يعني عن توجهات النظام وعن رفضه وعن رفضه لكي يسير الجزائريين في بطريقه سلميه يطالبون تغيير النظام السياسي الغير ديمقراطي. But fast forward a year and Dr. Bouchachi has bought into the government's political reform program. He's a candidate in this month's parliamentary elections. نحن نشارك في هذه الانتخابات ليس كما يقول البعض لإنقاذ النظام بل لإنقاذ الجزائر عندما نشارك نريد إعطاء معنى للعمل السياسي نريد أن الجزائريين أن يلتفتوا إلى العمل السياسي إلى النظام السياسي لأنها الطريقة الوحيدة للتغيير السلمي في الجزائر for some former human rights colleagues, it's a classic example of how a corrupt state apparatus co-opts and divides the opposition. Qui sont devenus totalement des digues des droits de l'homme, comme vous voyez, comme vous quand vous voyez une ligue des droits de l'homme qui dénonce ce pouvoir et qui qui le qualifie de pouvoir assassin et qui aujourd'hui se présente pour devenir député de ce pouvoir assassin. Là vraiment, je 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 perds le nord. Dans, 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 dans l'océan dans lequel le bateau Algérie est en train de voguer son rame et son boussole. There are dozens of new parties standing in this election, appearing to represent a wide cross-section of opinion, including Islamists close to the establishment. Transparency is promised, but opponents of the regime are unimpressed. Là, on ne peut pas parler d'élection, c'est ce que notre jeunesse appelle en Algérie le carnaval Fidjara, c'est une véritable mascarade. Actuellement, il n'y a aucun parti politique, je dis bien aucun parti politique, qui a un ancrage populaire. Tous les partis politiques sont sortis des laboratoires de cette police politique. The elections are basically a sham. They are there just to provide the regime with a facade of uh, transparency and of democratic legitimacy. No one really believes in these elections. Everybody knows in Algeria and outside of Algeria that this is just uh, a cosmetic operation to enable the regime to survive and to, to survive the Arab Spring. We would have welcomed the government's participation in this program. Our application for an official journalist visa to film in Algeria was ignored, as was our request for an interview with an Algerian ambassador outside the country. Election Day. President Bouteflika voted alongside his countrymen in what was claimed as Algeria's most transparent election ever. According to government figures, 42% of the population turned out to vote, a number that will be interpreted as a victory for its reforms. It's time now for the government to show that this election is not just the facade many in the opposition believe it to be. The country will not be contained if real power does not shift to the people. People like Hamza Rashak, who earned a living selling cosmetics from a cart in Jijel, a seaside town two hours from Algiers. Hamza didn't vote. Just days before the election, the 26-year-old set fire to himself in despair. Police had forced him to stop work and taunted him in front of his friends. He could take no more. Young people reacted in fury, attacking Jijel police station. Hamza's story mirrors that of Tunisian Mohamed Bouzizi, whose self-immolation last year sparked uprisings across the Arab world. The rising anger and frustration that erupts daily across Algeria are unlikely to be assuaged by elections that promise only a continuation of the unhappy status quo.